Um, so, hello everyone. We are Esther and uh, Robert, and we would like to um, share with you some debates we have been having these days around privilege and power in cycling research, and we've been exploring the value of reflexive practice. So, to start with, it all started with a Twitter conversation we had, and the conversation is going to continue in this presentation. So, we just want to share what we have been discussing uh, during several sessions of, of conversation with, uh, with Robert. So, it all started with this tweet about how, how much cycling is done and who cycles or not cannot be understood if we don't look at power relations, racism, misogyny, ageism. Too many invisible human beings, cyclists and non-cyclists, we all contribute to their invisibility if we don't acknowledge power imbalances, including privilege, entrenched in the urban mobility system and all other economic, social and environmental systems. But this is how um, I reacted to uh, one tweet about um, Black Lives Matter movement and how black people were not taken into account in urban design. And Robert texts me back in a private message saying that he recognized himself uh, also with this um, discomfort and uh, that it would be good to have a conversation about it. So we started speaking. And I'd like to start with um, and just showing a, a very a short video about what is privilege, just for us to, ha to have a reminder and to be in the same page. Privilege is a hard concept for people to understand because normally when we talk of privilege, we imagine immediate unearned riches and tangible benefits for anyone who has it. But white privilege, and indeed all privilege, is actually more about the absence of inconvenience, the absence of an impediment or challenge. And as such, when you have it, you really don't notice it. But when it's absent, it affects everything you do. And yeah, I hand over to Robert. Yeah, so um, as Esther was saying, uh, I got in touch with Esther after that tweet uh, because in my own kind of research practice, I've experienced being someone who is of one of the most privileged groups there is. Uh, experiencing discomfort and having to deal with it and negotiate it while trying to produce something that has value that has research integrity that is seen as kind of uh, legitimate research and also more importantly that is done in an inclusive way that's done in a way that does respect the different privileges powers and vulnerabilities that uh, the researcher and the participants of the research can have and negotiate together uh, so i suppose I was thinking of it to some extent uh, when we when we're thinking about the idea of reflexivity, which we'll both explore a bit more later on, is how often, well, at least for me, uh, aside from trying to follow a particular methodological approach, reflexivity can kind of be provoked in people, uh, as it as it certainly has been for me through experiences of discomfort, uh, because of certain scenarios or situations, and that, in that sense, uh, the discomfort is provocative. It provokes you into the sense of reflection into the sense of considering yourself amongst others and considering the whole research process really and how that uh, how the different positions of the different researchers and the participants can affect the research product yeah so one like the kind of major scenario i've come across uh, in my short research career so far is the the scenario of being a man researching aspects of gender and cycling and more importantly doing research uh, with women and with um, young women as well and how that can that can lead to scenarios where there are tension and that can lead to probably more even so, so for myself than necessarily the participant uh, discomfort in myself in trying to do that in a way that's uh, that allows for the comfort of the participant and allows for uh, people to feel like they can trust me that they, they can talk with me as they would someone who was a woman or a young woman themselves uh, so that i suppose is looking at like particular gendered experiences of cycling and, and, and being sensitive to the fact that and uh, not assuming that experiences are similar between uh, between men and women uh, and other uh, groups, it's important that we listen to this provocative discomfort and try to do something with it. Uh, so that kind of brings me to the question or has brought me to the question in the past of how do I deal with this discomfort? 
And um, I just added um, some cloud here on, on the right hand side to um, reflect on some of the, com the concepts that we discussed when we shared these moments of discomfort in our research with Robert. And we were talking about self-awareness, these red lights, being able to identify when these red lights are happening, uh, feeling this discomfort also in our body. So this is part of the embodiment uh, situation. And also there is a, a relation with empathy in which uh, we need to learn to think, um, to, to feel with the other person, with the other persons that we are um, researching about, the object of our research. So this relationship entails um, a good deal of this kind of empathy. And there's a hyperlink there for a short video on, you know, also to remind us what is empathy about. But we will discuss later um, about embodiment as well. Just to talk a little bit about one of the articles that we looked at uh, when we were having this series of uh, conversations around discomfort, around privilege and power, and around eventually what, what we were talking about uh, as reflexivity. We looked at some articles, one of which was Finlay uh, 2002, which was a really helpful article in, in kind of, uh, for us kind of organizing our own personal reflections and conversations and trying to, I suppose, uh, bring this Kind of add to the conversation around reflexivity and add to the, co the conversation around privilege and power and the importance of considering these ideas in doing research uh, to do with cycling. So uh, yeah one particular one particular perspective that Finlay argues uh, that kind of constitutes a, a reflexive approach or, or practice of reflexivity is that of intersubjective reflection. So Finlay talked about other ones like introspection like social critique, like col collaboration with, with uh, participants as well. Uh, but I just thought it would be helpful um, to, to focus just on, on one maybe because of the, the, uh, the, the whole variety of different ways you can do it. And this way, this one particularly resonates with myself uh, doing qualitative research. So uh, defining aspects then of intersubjective reflection, Finlay describes focusing on the situated and negotiated nature of the research encounter. And then as well, reflecting on the self in relation to others. So not just thinking about your own personal experiences, but also thinking about how you are situated in relation to the people you're doing the research with. Uh, so I think these like two these two quotes are very useful in thinking about one approach, one possible approach to trying to deal with this discomfort and by engaging in some sort of reflective practice. Uh, so s some of the scenarios in my own research. So for example. Uh, during my PhD, I was kind of aware that there are tensions between, uh, there are tensions, and this is once again a kind of a, a certain way of me putting it discursively, there are tensions between people who cycle and people who drive. Uh, and often this is put into separate groups, as we all know. Uh, but nevertheless, it, it does kind of form a bit of the context of going into an interview situation where uh, someone who cycles and, is, and, some, and myself trying to do a, a research project to do with cycling and risk, could think that I have a certain assumptions about cyclists. I, I may not be a cyclist myself. I may be someone who drives and considers or, or kind of contributes to a discourse around cyclists being reckless or rule breakers. So as a way of kind of dealing with this kind of, uh, pot this potential for the research, the, the interview encounter to be one in which I'm defined as someone who's unsympathetic to cycling, and the person who's being interviewed as being a, a cyclist to some kind of identity group, I uh, decided that it would be good to bring a helmet in to the interview to kind of disarm that, uh, the potential for that suspicion, and also kind of uh, define myself as a kind of insider amongst the, the, the cyclist participants who I would be interviewing. So this, this actually did work really, really well and was inspired by one of Rachel Aldrich's studies in which she used the same kind of approach. Um, and I think it's a good example of, of reflexive practice or trying to bring that, that idea of how you may be perceived in, in the interview encounter or in other uh, qualitative research or other research encounters um, as a self in relation to others. So yeah, I think I've probably talked enough about that, but some other concepts that just added in there are insider, outsider as a kind of positioning, uh, complicit participants. So perhaps let's say um, some, if I, was, if I was doing interviews, for example, with women, and there was women who had bad experiences with men in particular, they could position me as a complicit in that kind of behavior, or they could, could, could position me as an ally. So once again, you have this kind of tension and discomfort that needs to be kind of thought about 
and addressed in the in the research situation. And uh, yeah, that's why I think conversational partners is, is a good way of thinking about interviews in particular. Yeah, so this is just a bit more here as well about reflexivity from Finlay's perspective that I'll just go through, through quickly. And I think uh, it's a quote that Esther picked and I think it really kind of gives a really good summary of the various ways in reflexivity can be seen as a valuable tool. And that fits obviously with uh, the title of our presentation, which is exploring the value of reflexivity or reflexive practice. And uh, I would also like to talk about a little bit uh, about the other paper that has guided us through this the debate. Um, it's uh, Donna Haraway's paper from 1988, in which she talks about situated knowledge. And, and for us, it was very clear, uh, and, and it has already appeared, this, this idea of being situated. The, the, the way she describes it is the only way to find a larger vision is to be somewhere in particular. So, and she's very critical about um, the objectivity that science um, tries to, to have all the time. And it call, she calls it disembodied scientific objectivity. So embodiment is a very also important concept. Also, we have discussed it. It has appeared before. And embodied in itself is the awareness of the body as a body. And it has a very cultural meaning as well. So what she what she um, quotes uh, from from her uh, from her paper is what scientists believe or say they do, and what they really do have a very loose fit. This is the criticism that she has also the paper. She talks about the very uh, interesting concept of God trick, uh, that it it is seeing things, seeing everything from nowhere. So this is really impossible, and and she claims this is what science. Is trying to do but it is really impossible so an argument against various forms of unlockable and so irresponsible knowledge claims irresponsible means unable to be called into account so this is important as well because we're talking about responsibility which means accountability so if we display this responsibility we're not accountable anymore and that's what we're trying to do um, uh, when we do science objective science uh, and this is what uh, Donna Haraway tries to tries to uh, criticize and tries to also bring to light. And I think it's still valid from 1988, which is really interesting. So does this make you uncomfortable in some way about your research? We've discussed already a little bit, Robert and I, um, the, all of these little uh, or not so little concepts that uh, came about when we started uh, the conversation from that Twitter onwards. And these really made us uncomfortable. So if it made you uncomfortable, that's okay. Uh, we need to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. So, uh, and just taking it from there, I'd like to talk about the agency concept, which has already appeared in, uh, in the uh, conversation before. Acknowledging the agency of the world in knowledge makes room for some unsettling possibilities, including a sense of the world's independent sense of humor. So this is interesting because the uncomfortable uh, feeling is there with the unsettling possibilities and the sense of, uh, of humor for me is also very interesting because I think that is when um, Haraway detects that we are actually not separated, we're united and this irony can, uh, can also appear. So we're trying to put separation objectivity and in the end maybe we find we have more things that in common that we want to have or that we see we're having. Um, and I think this is also a very interesting game she plays um, all through this very interesting paper. And also um, something very simple in the end, that we are human beings doing research about human beings, actually not numbers. So coming to terms with the agency of the objects study is the only way to avoid gross error and false knowledges of many kinds in this science. So for me, this is also a call to um, the responsibility we have as scientists. This is uh, this is actually why how real science should be made, and not in an objective way. So she's shifting this this paradigm a little bit of science in a different way, and I think we're still struggling with it. And one of the things that came to mind while in my research, I'm, uh, I'm working with a European project that's called Inspires, and and they use a very interesting concept named Science Shop and it comes from the Netherlands. And it's basically that the civil society, a civil society organization has a question 
and it shares this question uh, with researchers and together they try to answer this question. And, and we had this, uh, this, this process with one civil society um, that was a, a cycling cooperative and they wanted to know the impact of their cycle training um, courses. So they had adult cycle training and they wanted to know how these uh, courses were impacting. Uh, they, they knew it was a positive impact in the people who took these courses and how it was impacting in their wider well-being. So they wanted to have um, a measure of it. And, and we entered in a series of discussion and co-production of research in this participatory, um, also action research because they're also activists uh, and, and there was an objective there of actually keeping that project alive, keeping the, the cycle training running. And for that, they needed funding and they needed to prove that that was impacting positively in, in, in the population. So that was actually their question. And to go about it, we started having meetings with them. And then as researchers, um, we started to talk with the cycle trainers and actually share with them, how would you do this research? We want to know what is the impact of well-being. We want to build this project and design this research together. How would you go about it? And then from these conversations we had with the cycle trainers, we uh, managed to find very efficient ways of, for example, doing the recruitment, of um, approaching the participants in a safe way, um, and things that really, um, being an outsider, we wouldn't have been able to know. So this was also getting into the kind of uh, insiders, um, view without involving them directly because they're not scientists, of course, but counting with them to have a, a better view, a better, um, a better view of what was uh, happening in that, in that uh, specific uh, project of cycle training and being able to then design a research project that was more effective in capturing uh, the reality without disturbing it. Uh, because it was very delicate, actually. Some people had fear, had trauma, so we had to find a way of making it um, comfortable for them to participate and to have um, a real view of what was happening. So, uh, lastly, and about conversation, which is something that we have also, um, uh, it has also appeared in one of the little clouds. So, accounts of a real world do not then depend on a logic of discovery but on a power charge social relation of conversation. And this also has to do with the scenario that I just explained of starting this conversation with uh, subjects, with people who are actually more in touch with the realities we want to measure or we want to study instead of going there and try to discover what is going on. So I think that is a really good also differentiation. And, and if you want to go, uh, Robert, about what happened, uh, what did you do uh, as a man researching gender and cycling? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, so I suppose this uh, quote is really, it's just so brilliant because it, the way, in the way it's phrased that it just shows how conversation involves so many, it can involve so many power dynamics and it's not some kind of necessary, uh, necessarily any kind of meeting of equals or meeting of people who have the same levels of power or have the same levels of uh, the same kinds of experiences or the same kinds of, uh, I suppose, yeah, privileges, I suppose. Um, so yeah, there was many ways that I've, I've dealt with in my PhD and in more recent work uh, with these kind of uncomfortable scenarios, I suppose. And yeah, I think there's, there was probably about three main strategies I've used. Um, one of them was trying to educate myself about critical perspectives. And so I understand uh, the different kinds of social relations uh, that exist between men and women, men, uh, boys and girls, and these kind of, uh, I suppose, yeah, categories of gender, I guess, uh, as well as looking at different, so this could be from feminism, this can also be from gender studies more broadly, and trying to, uh, I guess, understand and reflect upon how I, can, how I may influence uh, the research encounter, how, my research, uh, how, my, how I may influence then uh, the data that's collected, and as well in terms of trying to protect the participants and not putting them on the spot or giving them space to talk about uh, their own experiences in a way where they feel trusted and not judged uh, was very important for me. So, so yeah, the first, the first strategy was trying to educate myself on the critical perspectives. Then secondly, so I didn't go in naive. And then secondly, trying to listen non-judgmentally and trying to really take a, a back seat, which I think is good practice in general in qualitative research, irrespective of 
uncomfortable positions or, uh, or situations. But that was a that was another another aspect of how I carried out the research. I made an extra effort not to uh, not to appear, uh, I suppose, or come across as domineering or as interruptive or as uh, in any kind of way, I guess, overly trying to steer the whole research encounter. So really trying to be more of a conversational partner, as I was discussing before. But even even uh, even more, I suppose, more to a greater extent taking myself as, as much a backseat as possible and allowing, for example, in the focus groups for the people who were involved in the focus groups to talk as much as possible and actually lead the charge really. So I, I'd imagine as a man, I probably took even extra efforts than I would if I was a woman going into that situation and uh, perhaps in, in cognizance then of the potentially different uh, power charge social relation of conversation that could ensue. And then thirdly then, third and last, I made attempts to try to look at the uh, or try to kind of I suppose check if there were if there were some big differences between myself doing focus groups or other uh, other facilitators doing focus groups who were women so I think that was a, a pretty good idea a, a very kind of reflexive approach to try and see uh, see how much of an influence I was having and and if I could improve and if I could I suppose have uh, find a way to find a way to build a better rapport, find a way to maybe improve my own research practice so participants felt more comfortable, and then ultimately uh, find a way to deal with the problems of power and privilege that may have presented and really, um, I suppose, defined aspects of, of uh, the focus groups. And what I found in this particular one, uh, interestingly, was that actually it was more the style in which, in the style in which the, the focus groups were facilitated than the gender of the particular um, of the particular facilitator was actually more important. But the important thing in relation to reflexivity, I think, is that it was actually explored, and that it was actually taken seriously. That there was a, there was a real there was real potential for privilege to intrude and to change the entire uh, research process. Uh, so yeah, I, th I think that's probably enough about three three different ways. And can I just say as well, actually, that all of these kinds of uh, conversations and concepts we're talking about. Uh, at least from my perspective, this is these all are part of it, more of a kind of we're, we're taking a kind of loose approach to them because this is all imperfect and it is all very fallible. But it all comes from that that position of discomfort in the first place, as opposed to any kind of particular methodological approach. It's more a reflection uh, and a conversation really uh, that we're trying to contribute to. And in that sense, it is kind of loose and unfinished and and ongoing. So I'll just switch on to Esther. Absolutely. So it's kind of rounding up uh, because we are finishing as we started with this discomfort. And we also wanted to share with you some of the questions that uh, arise and that we would like to bring into the debate and hopefully um, make you also uh, think about it and engage in, the, in this debate with us. Uh, because this is, as Robert was saying, an ongoing challenge. So uh, how do we become these uh, reflexive researchers? Um, we've uh, shared some examples that uh, every case, every person might be different. Should we make reflexivity explicit in our research? I think it was in Finley, was uh, one of the, or, or two of the bullet points were about making this explicit, but how do we do it? And uh, we need to be transparent. Are there obvious power dynamics between researchers and the human objects of the research? That was the question that Robert was also reflecting about in, in his own research. Discomfort, red lights, um, we, we talked about it from the beginning. What do we do with them? How do we get comfortable in them? And how do you build that trust that we were talking about as well with the objects of, of our research with the people? How, do we, how can we make them uh, share with us? And, and uh, how can we make that um, conversation as comfortable as possible for all of them? So, this is a little bit our reflections and what we wanted to share with you. The big question is what next from here with all the things that have been going on lately. Uh, we really wanted to do something about it. And, and at least this is the first step, uh, thinking about it, uh, taking in reflexivity approaches, as Robert also was saying in, this last, uh, in, in his last uh, reflection, in his last uh, um, research, um, experience that, that you were saying so 
how do we how we take it forward from from here this is basically our our um, contribution so yeah i hope you enjoyed thank you all for watching i hope we can discuss this further in the second society sessions um, yeah so thank you thank you robert as well thank you <laughs>